Thank you all for coming today. And I want to tell you about um, a dream of a healthcare system that um, would feel something like this. What if uh, everyone had access to really good primary care and we're not worried about whether that access would be fettered based upon their ability to pay, whether they had health insurance, what kind of health insurance they had, their social station, or the color of their skin. What if when they went to that primary care, it was in their neighborhood, uh, it was a place familiar to them, they could walk there, it was a place where they were known. In fact, uh, they might tell you that it felt like they were going home that the providers were working as a team thinking about that person. So when you walk in, they know you, they know your history, they know what's coming next for your medical issues. They're prepared for that visit. They've got available to them your electronic health records, both of what happened to you in that clinic, but also in the rest of the system as you move through it. They also um, are thinking about more than just your health from a pr medical perspective. So that medical home understands that health is more than getting people to a doctor. It turns out, as many of you may know, and if you don't, you should, that health care is only about 10% of health. What really matters is economic opportunity and education and access to healthy food and a safe environment and places to exercise and a good social network and there's a few other things like choices we make around smoking and, and exercise. So the health center then would work with you not just to think about giving you the right medication at the right time for your diabetes but actually say instead of just you should eat the right food for diabetes. Here's a map of all the farmer's markets in your neighborhood. Here's some bus routes that'll help you get there. Oh, and by the way, if you have the need for this, these are the ones that take food stamps. And on Saturday, we're gonna have one here at the health center as well. That health center would be able to help you with other issues like a landlord with whom you might have trouble. They might have legal aid services. They might help you fill out a job application if you were struggling with literacy. They might have a place where your kids could go after school to study. It could actually also be a place where you would go as a destination to use the internet to do a lending library with books, to have exercise classes, to do some job training, to do some volunteer work. Maybe there's a garden outside where you can do some teaching um, with your children about how things grow. That medical home in that neighborhood for you would also not just think about you when you came in, but it would be thinking about your community. It would be a community-centered medical home. It would think about how it can push society, push policy, push stakeholders to make sure there are farmers markets and fresh food and safe environments and good schools. It would think about its responsibility to all of your health, not just to the medical care when you come in. It would also be connected to other community-centered medical homes in the region. So if for some reason you work across town and you need to see somebody at another site, they would also have access to your medical records. They would be partnered with your community center. And um, if you needed to have access to specialty care, or hospital care, or social service agencies, you could get connected through your community-centered medical home. And that is actually not a dream, although it was in 2005 for many of us. It is actually a reality. We have spent the last five years uh, in this area of New Orleans building that for our population so that today 25 organizations are running 90 sites that are part of a network that takes care of one in five people in the New Orleans area who call those their community medical homes. These are people who are sicker than the average American but get better care than the average American. They also report a better experience and that their care is more affordable than the average American. We very deliberately built this system so that it would address the needs of the most vulnerable in our community, those that have more medical problems, more social needs, transportation issues, language access problems, to prove that you could do it, that you could build team-based care, you could make it accessible, you could make it affordable, you could make it patient and community-centered and, and do it on scale across a, a broad metropolitan area. So how did we get there and why did, why did we never have that before? Because we did not. We, in 2005, what we had was principally a public hospital system that was struggling to provide care for a low-income population that had a lot of social needs in addition to medical needs. 
It was uh, driven by a financing system that was very hospital focused and didn't allow us to spend money on primary care. So we were, instead of spending pennies for primary care to do better quality work, we were spending dollars in emergency rooms and in hospitals to treat the same illness that could have been done in the neighborhood. We were doing that because we were constrained by the, by the rules of payment and because we had big boxes already built and structures in place where that care was delivered. When Katrina happened and the town flooded and our entire healthcare infrastructure by and large was decimated, we had an opportunity to rethink that. We knew we needed to rethink that because the, that structure we had for healthcare was getting us the most unhealthy population in the country year after year after year. It was costing more for our population to get care than other places in the country, and the quality was worse. The experience was poor for patients, and it was driving doctors away, and they weren't doing primary care, and we did not have neighborhood-based care. So what we had was a system that needed to be redesigned, and we had then an opportunity to do it. I think the story of how it happened is one of the uh, highlights of my life. Uh, we have been working on this for five very uh, intense years. Yesterday, we had um, a historic moment in our state when, <laughs> when leadership, uh, the governor and uh, our mayor, parish presidents, uh, aligned with the federal government to decide that it made more sense to, to continue investing in community-based medical homes and neighborhoods where we could not just spend pennies and not spend dollars, but actually continue this model of care that was the dream of many people in the country and was living and happening, we had proved the concept. So we have decided as a state that going forward, that is the way we want people to get care in our area. And now we have an opportunity to offer that if we do all the things right across the state and indeed across the nation. Getting there was um, some of the things we love most about, I love most about post-Katrina New Orleans and what I'd love to see other communities be able to get involved in. It was um, partnerships, it was relationships. We had very few relationships in medicine uh, outside of who you saw in the hallway. We have worked very hard to not just forge bonds, between academia and faith-based organizations and new community groups, but also social service agencies and neighborhood associations and schools. Because again, we realize that health is, getting, is more than getting people to a doctor. And so we have got to be a part of that larger conversation. The deliberate action on the ground was to build models so that when people said, well, gosh, what, what, what would a, a medical home feel like? we can bring you to one and I can point to it and say this is what it feels like. Talk to this random patient in the waiting room and they'll tell you what it feels like to come here. We also deliberately set about to have a policy effort that would lay a framework, a blueprint, so that it wasn't just a few experimental models, but indeed there was a long-term plan to see that this vision came to reality and was sustainable and that, that blueprint was signed on to, including a set of principles by all the major stakeholders who had a, as we say in the South, a dog in that hunt, um, to agree that we needed to have, uh, it's good to do that after Carville, right, because that's what he would, he would say, that who would agree that um, community-based primary care matters, that we should have that accessible to everyone, and that we ought to make sure it's high quality, that we ought to also make sure that it's using information technology, electronic medical records, so it's a modern system and not go back to old ways. And then finally, that we would find a way to finance it and make it sustainable. So we, we said structure, community-based care. We said quality was the second piece. The third piece is use technology because it makes it safer, more efficient. And the final piece was financing, which we finally achieved yesterday. And I think we have a really bright future for that going forward. I want to uh, just add what this means of, for many of us engaged in this, it does mean that patients that we know and love will continue to get care. The people that work for those patients in those medical homes and in that network will continue to get to do the work that they love and get up and do every day with um, a great amount of commitment. But what Louisiana is now doing for the country is informing the way healthcare is going to get delivered. And we are actually rewriting the rules federally and creating new vocabulary and language that can be used as we try to expand this model to other communities so that everyone, not just certain populations, not just certain kinds of people, but all of us,
can actually have access to a community-centered medical home. Thanks.